no plan whatever, which we do every once in a while. However, in order to talk about something which is necessary to think of from every viewpoint we can, and which was brought up at one meeting, and which I know people did not understand, let's talk a little bit and think together on an enormously difficult subject to grasp, which is simply the fact as simple as the words are, we are not at all who we think we are. I will tell you, none of us in this room are at all what I think I am, what you think you are. If we saw this clearly, I would not be angry at anything. I would not be made nervous by anything, psychologically. Physically, I could get anxious. My body could get anxious over lack of food if there was a famine, something like that. I would not try to, try to hold, I would not try to hold onto any other human being. I would not be religious in the usual sense. I would be my own religion. All right? The fact is, the fact is, you and I do not exist, period. We do not exist, period. Now, if I can see what I don't consist of, all these reactions, all these responses, all this pettiness, then I'll see what it means to not exist, which means I'll know that I exist in a totally new way, in which there are no questions at all. This is what was brought up down there. When I ask a question of any kind, what does it mean? Very simple. It means there's something that is confusing me. Right? I'm not talking about ordinary work, of course. <coughs> Carpentry or engineering, whatever. We're not talking about that. When I ask a question about my life, what should, what should I do about my employment? What should I do about my, my friends? What should I do about my raging mind, about all these things I've concealed? What should I do about it? I think I may go mad if I don't do something about it. This simply indicates that I am still, still very much living from an idea of who I am. And that idea of who I am is the only thing I know, so I've trusted it in spite of the fact that it betrays me 50 times a day. That is, it makes me uncertain, it makes me miserable, it makes me afraid, it makes me suppressing things, it makes me feel guilty. If I understand that to ask the question about who I am creates the false idea of who I am. The very asking of the question is a mental movement that creates the problem. And if I see that and I have the courage to not ask the question, how can I create the problem? So the question itself is the problem. It's a mental movement. I ask, I ask, who am I? Take that as the question. I ask, who am I? How are you going to find out? Because you want to find out who you are on the level of thought, then you'll answer the question in a thousand different ways, and every one of them will be false, and you'll be miserable. You'll be unhappy.
So maybe I ran across the idea that I can put an end to the question itself. Put an end to the question itself, which puts an end to me. Now I know, now I see what it means to not exist. To not exist means to not be thinking about who I am and what I must get in order to be secure, or what I must get rid of in order to be secure, or what I must have, or what I must do. Even thinking I must dedicate my life to God is going to make me very nervous, very anxious. So I see that it's a wrong mental movement that gives me this false personality, this false identity. That, that is the fundamental problem of my whole life. At this point I become quite, quite conscious that I can, I haven't done it yet, but I, I become conscious of what I really can do, but it's not me doing it at all. Now God, truth, is beginning to do it. Because I am no longer trying to do anything at all. I see the futility of it. Everything I've tried has is, is flopped. Flopped. I know it. When the day after I got married, I knew it. The day after I got unmarried, I knew it. That I'd be going right back to where I was before. So if I can see myself, which is not a correct phrasing really, but see means someone sees it, but if I can see myself, using that generally, as someone who has no need to think about himself except on the normal everyday level, I need to have food, you need a roof over your head. If I can see that I don't have to think about myself because there's no one there to think about, I said there is no one there to think about. You think there is. You really, I know, right here. You think there is. Don't you? Don't you? Don't you? You do? So you're anxious over that. Now what could be, what could be more futile than being anxious over an illusion? Okay, I'll ask you a question. You think in, in view of everything you've heard. Who are you trying to save? Who are you trying to save? Yes, yes, but you're quite, quite convinced, quite convinced that there is someone there to save, which is the, the, again, the fundamental problem, the fundamental illusion around which every, every other problem that you or I have revolves. If you have a problem, if your mind runs wild, if you're anxious about the future or regretful of the past, it simply means that you do not as yet understand everything I've talked about up until now. And especially, you do not understand that you don't exist. You don't exist in the way you now think you do. But you do exist in this new way, which you, which you don't know about at all, which is not necessary for you to try to understand because you, then you go into imagination, an illusion on that. And we've had many examples of that. Then you become spiritual. 
and talk about God. Everything that you have to give up to find this pearl of great price is what is bothering you. Everything that you have to give up is what is bothering you. But our troubles become our best friends, our cherished companions through life. That's right. The best friends of most human beings are their own troubles, their own madness. their own thrills of egotism, of vanity. Very fortunately for each one of us in this room, very fortunately, this man sitting in front of me has one responsibility in life. This lady sitting in front of me and those of you listening to the tape and the rest of you in this room has one responsibility. You see this one responsibility of yours, it will relieve you of so much weight that you've been carrying. False weight which you love because the weight itself gives you a false feeling of life. That one responsibility is to change me, to change you. Which means I'm going to have to look and study very hard to see, to see where my present mental and emotional and psychic weakness is unconsciously permitting you and you and you to influence me. I'm going to have to see how suggestible I am from you. It's my weakness, but at the same time, that they're both on the same level. You are my enemy in finding the truth only because I am my own enemy. Because if I wasn't mine, you couldn't touch me. So throwing all responsibility and attention and energy back on freeing myself and seeing how relatives in my own conditioning, all mixed up together, prevents me from taking this responsibility with strong emotion in a right determination I'm going to say if I have to give up your friendship and your companionship and your good uh, thoughts toward me and what I'm getting from you if I have to give that up in order to understand what <coughs> that man is talking about tonight, I'm going to make an effort to do it. I can't afford to be influenced by you anymore. And you're not going to make me feel guilty anymore either. That's been one of the tricks of society to make me feel guilty. It's not going to work anymore. So that by long hard work, going through, going through my own hell, walking right into the center of it, and being very careful to see it without putting a self-centered label on it 
That's very important, and I hope you didn't miss that. Going through my own hell without putting a self-centered label on it, such as, I'm a hypocrite. You are, but you can't call yourself one. You understand? You are a hypocrite. You are divided, but you can't call yourself one. Because that is simply another label, a self-label, a self-reference. See hypocrisy, deception as the fact, but not really you, because it isn't. It really isn't. So going through this hell, doing my best to put all these things together, till I reach the point where I'm no longer afraid to be a nobody, to not exist. No longer afraid of that. Because you know, you listen. If I flare up, flare up at anything, if I get, if I feel contemptuous toward anyone, which is simply another reaction in me, if I have any negative state at all, it simply means that I have not, not understood this truth, these truths that we've heard tonight, which it is possible for me to understand and therefore be free of what I used to call me. When I catch the first glimpse inside this, this door, I become less and less and less fearful of the death of, quote, me, which is the beginning of new birth, of new life, which is not something I'm talking about tonight but which I know is a fact. It can be a fact for any of us in this room. You stop scoffing at the truth. And if you're, you're not going to believe this, but I'm telling you, I'm telling you to listen to this tape. If you scoff, if you scoff or sneer at anyone or anything, that part of you is an enemy of truth. That is what the devil is. But you can't call yourself a devil. Don't call yourself a devil. That is your present state or my present state, but it is not you or me at all. Don't you, don't you any longer be, be bluffed, be bluffed by the devil in you, the devil being negative states. You are now, you are now. <clears throat> and you don't see it. You don't know how bad you are because you're still bluffed by it. And because you still say, that is me. Wait till you see. Wait till you see that it really isn't you at all and the bricks will fall off your back. Because then you'll stop fighting evil and you can't win when you fight evil. Remember we said God doesn't fight with the devil? but we can understand. I can understand what this is all about. Then, I, then I'll never be embarrassed or feel ashamed or feel tense, tense that you might find me out. How many of you in this room or listen to this tape are afraid that someone might find you out? What are you hiding? All that goes. It's just another form of hanging on to yourself, of being a sinner, which you don't understand at all. But we're here to begin to see. Begin to see that the minute I refer anything to myself, on the psychological level. I can refer to it for the tenth time. I can refer to it to 
myself when I get hungry. I can say, I am hungry. That's not psychological, that's physical. But if I say, I am good, or I am bad, or I am jealous, or I am an earnest seeker, anything like that is self-reference. And it builds the illusion that I have a self which can be built. So you and I will go through life, and as we wake up, in the most dreadful state any human being could be in, which is the state of being, being unable to be told anything. Unable to be told anything about ourselves that could rescue ourselves. Can you think of anything more dreadful than that? You, we pretty much know what that state is, don't we? Because we can look back, maybe even a short time ago, and see how little anyone could tell us about anything. The defenses were so thick. Again, and then I'll stop. It is very fortunate, and this is much deeper than you imagine, it is very fortunate that I am responsible only for me, for getting rid of the trash here, not for you. God didn't make me your savior. You are responsible for you, not for that lady. And finally, therefore, my aim, your aim, is to attain, a, to use the phrase, to attain a cosmic ruthlessness with me. I am not going to put up with it anymore. I'm not going to go around feeling like a, a guilty sinner. I refuse to call myself stupid anymore. Because you're an egotist when you do that. I'm going to be so ruthless with everything that's wrong in me that the time will come when something will break. Heaven knows what it is. But I know, I know, and you know, that it is right to be ruthless with me. It's right for this man to be ruthless with this man, this lady with this lady. I am not going to put up with self-lying anymore. If I catch myself in a lie, I'm going to be ruthless and tell myself it's a lie. So I don't have to suffer from being a liar anymore. Now, I challenge you, and I'll challenge myself likewise, to go out of this meeting tonight with a new determination to be just as ruthless, that's the best word I can think of, maybe you can think of a better one, tough, as ruthless as I can with me. So that I won't be an animal, a ruthless animal anymore, destroying you in the name of words. And so I'll cease destroying myself in the name of words. Do you understand what that means? You do. Because we use words, we use words to cover our dark state. So I can't use labels anymore, except as everyday convenience be above labels to where I am something instead of trying to be something. The only thing I can do and the right thing to do is to cease to be someone. Not to try to be someone, but to cease to be someone. Cease to be this phony, this imposter, this self-punishing entity that I've taken as real so long, but which doesn't exist. Then I understand perfectly, clearly, calmly, everything that has been said in this room tonight. 
because now I have a, a new mind that really understands and that no longer fights. How many of you find your mind wandering away during the meetings to other places, to faraway places? Well, practically everyone that admitted it. <laughs> As an exercise, as an exercise in watching your own mind, bring it back, bring it back. And one reason your mind wanders is because you think perhaps that you have heard that before and why hear it again? Try to listen in a new way. Try to, <clears throat> try to listen so personally, so personally that it hurts. You know, if you would get your feelings hurt here, you could get them hurt in a new way so that you wouldn't get them hurt out there. So I'll ask the question for the tenth time. How many of you had, had your feelings hurt in the last week or so? Your feelings hurt anyone here? Hmm? Huh? Who got hurt? Those of you who had your feelings hurt, who got hurt? You don't know. You felt, you felt hurt feelings. You know why you felt them? Because you think you still exist. You're still trying to be somebody. Okay, let's talk about anything you'd like to talk about. If the mind thought that its life depended upon its ability to listen, that it had to listen, it would listen. And it's a funny thing, its life does depend upon it. Yes, it does, giving proper attention to these things. But our sleeping parts do not want to listen to this. They don't want anything to do with it. It's much easier, uh, the devil tells us, to continue to live in dreamland of already having it made. You know, there's parts of each one of you in this room but have no intention of absorbing this. No intention of, you don't believe that I'm telling you. There may be major parts of you that have no intention of letting the truth do its work inside of you. And you don't know it. That is what self-division is. With cosmic science, that is what hypocrisy is. And there's no moral judgment on there. That's just a statement of the fact, like a doctor would say, you have a certain sickness or something. Yes? I'd like to make a comment online. I have discovered that I was reading about we lying about things which we will, don't even realize we are lying. Quite right. And I have realized just faintly certain things. And I just in a moment where I realized how sincere I stand there and lie. How sincerely you lie? Yes. <laughs> with one part I see it, it's horrible, and with the other part I could stand there and deny it right in front of me. And then it goes away and it won't reoccur for a while. How many of you have told a lie in the last week? <laughs> in the last five minutes? <clears throat> yes. You said that we are, I am still trying to be somebody. Yes. And I saw 
during the past week sometime that even with the work that what I have been doing is again building more images of myself as a person who is not doing the work but a, the type of person that I think I'm going to change into by working on myself but there I'm still image building that is imagination right all right listen listen to this question now I'll leave a little pause afterwards so you can think rightly toward it who are you trying to be who are you trying to be every answer you give with your mind is a wrong answer every answer you give with your conditioned thought is a false answer You say I'm trying, even if you say I'm trying, I'm trying to be spiritual, I'm trying to be good. What's your idea of goodness? There can't be an idea of goodness. Is goodness an idea or is it a state in which the idea is absent? Real goodness is the absence of the idea, of the idea of goodness. You have an idea of goodness, and the other person doesn't believe in it, you have a right to blow him up, to argue with him. Can you imagine anything more foolish or ridiculous than people arguing about God? about whose God is the right God. That's an idea of goodness, isn't it? An idea of who God is. Which means you're not good at all. Why callest, callest thou me good? Jesus said. But it's very difficult to break this habit of going along with our own conditioning as to what is good because the vanity parts of us get certain benefits quote marks out of going along with social morality do you really see this huh or do you want your day in court hoping you'll win the lawsuit You're going to have to make up your mind. Turn it on, Rudy. You're going to have to make up your mind what you want. You want something from that society out there? And you had better go a lot farther than simply saying that you don't want anything from that society out there. You stop saying it and start really doing it. So that you're not on the same level as society, therefore contributing to all the horror of the life we're in. You want advantages over other people? We spoke about that in the recent talk down there. You want advantages over people? How many of you want some kind of advantage over someone else in this room? You want an advantage of any kind, a spiritual advantage, whatever that is? Don't you see what's wrong with that? Don't you see it? If you want to destroy yourself, you go right ahead and continue to want any kind of advantage over another person because that means you still think that you exist and he exists. You are, you are a cause of the horror. All you nice people sitting here are the cause of war which people suffer.
don't let this fall on your on your unconscious guilt because that would be a mistake and you wouldn't understand what we're talking about because you're still calling yourself guilty still <laughs> calling yourself bad which means you're tied by time and memory and self-reference you don't exist two seconds ago one second ago you exist right now in a new way which means if you really see this if you really understand this and you should make a mistake of some kind you said the dumb thing you thought the the jealous thing the evil thing and if you really understood this and were working real hard on yourself you could be free of it now because you're not carrying it over with mechanical thought which means the non-existence of you which means morality and conscience which means you're breaking the chain the chain of time the chain of self the chain of horror who wants an advantage over someone else you can't tell me you could use words but you can't tell me you can describe yourself but that's not telling me anything who wants the advantage I'll tell you who wants the advantage the illusory part of you or of me that wants to prove itself by saying ha I made it and you're sick and you're neurotic you're a rich neurotic successful neurotic a famous neurotic and if you hang around people like you are you'll both drag each other down into the ditch there's no one there there is no one there to get an advantage over anyone. Evidence? Evidence? Whenever you feel you've made it, a second later, you know you haven't. Right? Perfect evidence. But still, we fight and scream and say next time will be it and it never is is it never is so we conceal you know what you're concealing if you're asleep you're concealing incredible violence violent thoughts they don't may not express themselves physically Why don't you just take it as a fact? Why don't you just take it as a fact that nothing can be done on the level of thought except, except elementary knowledge, elementary understanding, which in itself can't change you at all because you still, still make the mistake of identifying with the knowledge man says I've read Zen literature for 10 years and he's bragging about it he's identified with the knowledge which in itself may be quite correct some of it well, I've read the New Testament for years the knowledge might be quite correct all right another question Uh, no, no, excuse me, Rudy. I was going to get <laughs> just a second, and then you may go on. What is it like individually? What is it like to live with you? How do you find it living with you? Horrible. 
pretty hard on the other guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Rudy. Uh, earlier in the talk, you said when I try to do something, uh, I usually get into more problems, but there's something else that would take over and knows what to do. And right. you want to know what it is. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Joan, you commented on that, did you not? Would you comment again? Did you get his question? No, we repeat it. Repeat the question. Anytime I try to do something, I usually will get into more problems. I cannot do anything. I only will make more problems. But then Vernon said there is something else that would take over and knows what to do. When he wants to know what this something else is, did you want, do you want to guarantee? you comment on it? Why don't you find out yourself? Okay. That's my usual answer. <laughs> we had that down in the talk, one of the other talks. Person, people always insist on a 90-day guarantee, and you're not going to get it. Because wanting the guarantee means wanting to be in this room and be in the next room at the same time, which is impossible. To get to that room, you have to leave this room, right? Uh, perfect logic? Perfect logic? In order to be over there, I have to cease being here. In order to be this newness we're talking about, I have to cease being who I now am. Do that. Do that. Without asking what's it like over there. Can, can, I, still, can I still have my hatred and be new? Can I still have my hatred and get rid of my hatred? Now, this is serious. Look how ridiculous that is. Look how ridiculous it is. Can I become a new person and still stay as I am? Huh? See, this is what I want. I don't want to drop anything. <laughs> Let's all have a good cry. <laughs> I have told you, I have told you, and I will tell you again, that I know, I'm speaking personally now, I know that this other state exists. I know it exists for anyone who wants it badly enough. Now, you take it from there, starting with this ruthlessness toward yourself we're talking about. Just uh, comment on Rudy's question. Knowledge the answer to his question is a level of functioning. And knowledge will give us a clue to what that level is, but it cannot verbally communicate what it is, but it gives us a big clue. Okay. And the big clue is that this part of us is not seeking to promote anything, or to protect anything, or to gain any advantage. So that as soon as we see, I'll just, before I complete that sentence, let's just say that we're, it's like we're caught in a net, in a web. The start result, the web is our own desire to affirm our so-called self. Right. And as soon as we stop doing that, we start moving toward a state of being which does not continually, as Rudy says, create more problems for itself. Correct. So right. it's as soon as we see that we're attempting to promote something or protect it or affirm it right it's a dead giveaway right if we can catch ourselves doing and drop it that is the end of it the and, specific, excuse me excuse me I'm going to say the specific question in costa mesa that the fellow asked which brought up vernon's comment was to compress it was how can i stop being irritated at my wife well there's one answer stop stop being irritated and see how how hard that is. Again, we'll just talk pretty much informally this morning. Letting whatever wants to happen simply happen. At the same time, while we're all being very alert, very observant, very much alive, to what is happening inside of you, inside of me.
getting ourselves out of the way as much as possible. And maybe when we leave here, we will have achieved our aim of getting ourselves one-tenth of one percent more out of the way than was the case when we first came into the room. So in order to have something to talk about, you might want to write this down, a single sentence. If you don't, you can remember, memorize it or absorb it and then become it, then become it. When living from the real world, the artificial world is handled perfectly. When living from the real world, the artificial world is handled perfectly. Do you know, do you know what the real world is? Now you can't separate as yet, can you? There are too many confusions because you're taking, listen to this, there are too many confusions because you're taking the idea, the thought, the description, the label, the word of the real world as the real world itself. So you can even, or I can even deceive myself by saying there is no need for me to be upset by what happened because I read in that book or heard at that talk and I've been convincing myself that nothing can touch me. Nothing real happens. Nothing real happens. I'm st I still feel threatened and upset and insecure and defensive and nervous because I don't know what it means yet to live, to live in the real world. And the real world is very easy to describe, isn't it? The real world is the absence of me, which is the absence of all reactions and emotions, reasonings that come out of the bundle of me, the absence of it. You, you get rid of that, and there is the real world then you can live in the earthly insane asylum, which we do anyway. We can live in the earthly insane asylum and not be afraid of the fact. And not be afraid of the fact that you are surrounded by insanity masquerading as sanity, as goodness and rightness simply because you are indeed living in the real world in which there is no, there is no insanity for you. I asked you once, and I saw a raise of hands, and I'll ask those of you listening to this tape, have you ever been scared that you might go mad, mentally mad? Have you ever looked at your mind and been frightened at what you see? To that degree, will you be frightened of the exterior world because they're the same thing, but you don't know that yet. Because the thought, the thought, I am sane in an insane world is all wrong. This is strong stuff, let me put it strongly. If I say, I am sane, religiously sane, psychologically sane, if I am sane in an insane world, I am insane. Which means that the expression, the thought, the description is taking the place of living. They're starting, all, as always, with I. I am sane, I am good. That means that means I'll be scared. When I really see, when I really understand, there's not an ounce of fear of the plain fact that this is a mad world and you 
None of you in this room or listening to this tape know how mad it is. You really don't. I'm telling you. And I'm telling you so that you'll begin to see it. Because that means you'll have to see your own madness. What is madness? Long list. I only have five fingers on this hand. Yeah. This is a test as to how sane you are. Now you test yourself. If you get depressed, you are not sane. If you try to possess any other human being, you are not sane. If you still want to be somebody, you are not sane. If you want people to say nice things to you and approve of you, you are not sane. You're still living from what you have described yourself and in spite of all your coming to this class and reading all the books, you really don't see that your self-description is not really you at all. Your self-description is someone who has failed even. Your self-description is a self-description period, which is lack of intelligence and lack of sanity. And that is what I am punished by, and that is what you are punished by. Strong stuff, right? To look, to look for a savior of any kind is a lack of intelligence. Understand? Understand? No? Let's see if you can understand this. Who is trying to be saved by a savior? Who's trying to be saved? You, you think you exist. The whole delusion of someone there to be saved will collapse when you know what it means to come to the end of ordinary thought, ordinary ideas. Wouldn't it be nice, and it is nice, not to have anyone there who needs to be saved from anything except cold weather or lack of food. That's okay to be saved from that. Who on earth are you trying to save? Whose psychic survival are you fighting for? You think about that. It'll be the shock of your life when you find out there's no one there which is real salvation. There's no one there. The reason, the reason when we become sane and authentically intelligent, the reason we're able to handle the exterior world properly is several reasons. One of them being, I am not trying, I'm not throwing a demand out into that world, a demand under my wife, my children, my employment, my government, <coughs> or anyone else. <coughs> I'm not throwing a demand out there in an effort to keep the kidding process alive that I exist as someone who can add something. So if you don't give me what I want, if society doesn't give me what I want, what is that to me? Whew, as if you have anything to give me. Any of us. As if you have anything to take away from me. See, see how the nervous struggle comes to an end? See how it comes to an end? See, see the only way it can possibly come to an end? When I come to an end. 
but it was pointed out when the rifle that I think is going to slay me comes closer, I start getting scared and hostile and defensive and offensive and violent, fearing, fearing my own real deliverance, which is in the extinguishing of the illusion that I exist according to thought, to description. And if you think this is repetitious, I will tell you how to get over that idea. Be the truth itself. Be, you be, what I'm talking about this morning. And all this will be very beautiful no matter how many times you hear it. You'll be very grateful, really grateful, and using grateful in the right in the right way. Very grateful. Listen, very grateful that God really exists. And I don't have to, I don't have to fight to find God anymore. All I have to do is see the illusion of seeking something, hoping and believing that the thrill of accumulated philosophies and associating with like-minded people, seeing, putting an end to the excitement of this, which I have called God, truth. And I'll say that in another way because that may have been lost. In my present delusion, I live from excitement. I live from the thrill of egotism I get by repeating to myself and to other people the thrilling idea that I have found God. I have found God. And the more people I can surround myself with who say the same thing with me, that is, who confirm my delusion, the more excitement, the more pseudo-security I get. Which means I'm crouching in a corner, feeling temporarily safe and temporarily affirmed because you smile at me and you pray with me and you read the same religious books I do, and therefore my hidden fears are pressed down. Oh, but I'm terrified. What if I should lose my friends who believe? What if, what if ha- something happens to my personal life that destroys my pretty illusion that I'm a Christian, that I know God? What if something, the rifle comes toward me and threatens my corner? And so I am filled with hatred and violence toward anything that threatens my so-called security in the corner. This is the false world, the artificial world. And if you ever tell me the truth, I will run away from you. I will feel hostile toward you. I will lie. I will have no conscience. All right. Where am I huddling in the corner? Those of you listening to this tape, where are you huddling in the corner? If you understand what I'm talking about, and a part of you does indeed, where are those of you sitting in the room, huddling in your particular corner, playing it safe, staying in the artificial world, 
because egotism and vanity is always afraid of the real world because it will be destroyed as, at its hands, which it will certainly, certainly happen if I come out, dare to come out of the corner. What do you want? What do you want from the society as it is presently set up? What do you want from it? You want a lot of money? You want a lot of good friends around? You want to join a lot of clubs? <clears throat> you want to, in some way, use, use this society to make you feel okay? One of the gangs. If you're one of the gang, I'm sorry, but you are one of the monsters. You are one of the hypocrites. You are one of the people without any conscience at all. Have any of you ever had a very good friend that you betrayed? Huh? Someone who gave you what you wanted for a while and you betrayed them? Huh? making all kind of lies and excuses, of course, blaming them for the betrayal and all that. See? See, you have no conscience. You don't care whether you hurt anyone or not. As long as you get what you want, what do you care? So, by living in this present society and being part of it, that is my whole self problem because I'm under the delusion that this society can give me security which it can't because the whole thing is based on the illusion the grand illusion that we are separate from each other I want to be able and you want to be able to live right then then live right in the middle of the insanity, doing business if necessary in order to make money, taking care of the home and paying bills, paying taxes, living right in the midst of the result of human insanity, but understanding it and not being a part of it and not contributing to it. last night what it's like for you to live with you for you to live with you for you to live with you wouldn't it be nice to be free of that as was pointed out the enemy is me the enemy is you no one else cease to love cease to get a kick out of Cease to get a thrill out of being your own worst enemy. And don't you dare deceive yourself any longer. Don't you come here and tell me how much you want out. Who are you kidding? I sit here and, and let, let you blab on, knowing you're lying, but no, you're not. What's the point of saying anything to you? No point in it. Maybe you'll wake up someday. Don't you come here and tell me how much you want out. Because I know, I know that you still love the enemy inside yourself too much yet to let it go. The enemy, listen how strange this sounds. The enemy inside of you, you have made your best friend. You know who this friend is? This friend is a treacherous imposter who attacks you every day and you're so stupid you're so stupid 
you call this enemy your best friend and you don't even know what's going on inside of you that's how stupid you are what on earth is going to wake you up comments questions Maybe a little lengthy, Bernie. Uh, just a couple minutes to tell a story. All right, speak up loud and clear. I was a small, built, 16-year-old needing a job. I used devious means to get the job. The job was driving. It was called chauffeur. And uh, I was interviewed by the lady, the, the wife of the man for whom I was to drive. And she, as a child, I saw an odd look on her face, so I knew there was something she wasn't telling me. She asked me, was I strong? I said, yes, and I was, for a small person. She said, you will have to help my husband. Now, in that moment, there were several things that I recall going through that my mind. I knew him to be a businessman. And I thought, oh boy, me, ninth grade, helping, an educated, full-grown man, okay? Then the thought, right after that, whoops, what kind of help is that human going to ask for me? Fair. So what it boiled down to, the man had double braces on his leg and a broken shoulder, and the help I had to do was he walked on my arm and shoulder. I physically carried part of his weight when we walked, and I'd help him in and out of the car and lock his braces. <clears throat> And when I first met him, he looked like a minister. His, his physical appearance was that of ministers I had seen. Suit, tie, uh, nice hairdo, nice smile, all real nice smile. And he sold many things. And I watched him steal from the people. I watched him steal from the people he sold. I watched him lie to them. And I saw his viciousness when we were 50 miles from home base. I saw the man going to horrible viciousness and turn on me I wasn't afraid physically I knew I could physically fight the man but I was scared to death of the mind of that monster and he was a monster we were inside of a little coupe car so I did the only thing I knew how to do at the time I probably cussed at him violently I got out of the stopped the car got out of the car in traffic <clears throat> and at the door I cussed again and told him, you can get back any way you wish. I don't care what happens to you. And he turned from his viciousness to crying like a little baby and pleading with me, a child, to please get back in the car. He couldn't drive. He was crippled. I'll do this. I'll raise your pay. So, here old sympathetic savior. He gets back in the car and he drove him back. We got back to the hotel and I was fired and didn't get my week's wages. No. In a matter of a few hours, I saw a complete go-through picture, life story of me. I didn't see it then, I see it now. Right. I filed it then, right? because I still have it in my memory, and probably with quite a bit of the emotion that I had at that time. I wasn't watching real close. But it's the same as our, uh, life's, our life story of today, changing that role, that personality might nice smile when you're pleasing me when I was carrying him around and feeling proud of that oh yes I was pleasing the man he was pleasing me he was paying me and then the snap flip of that movie from one film to another into a monster right into a monster right <clears throat> we've all had experiences like that Where might, where might we be doing something like that today, completely unconscious of it? Question. Where can you be touched to arouse the monster in you or me? What could someone say to you or to me that would force us 
to drop the nice mask, maybe internally, of course, and reveal the horrors that are really inside of us. Where are you unaware of what you are hiding? What's the area? Maybe you could track down the area. Maybe the area of sex, the area of money. Where can you be touched? That is where you or I are suffering, where I can still be hurt. That means, very simply, very simply, that I've got the role going in there, which I project outwardly in order to con you and get what I want from you. We have a lot of, a lot of cleaning up to do. Yes. What you said on, uh, on the other, on the other half, they don't tell me how much you want out. And to see this, I have to see it during the week. While I'm here at this meeting, I say I want out. So where can you be touched? Where can I be touched? Right. And it's an authority. When somebody tells me what to do during the week, that's when my anger comes up. That means how much do I want out? I might say here during the week, I want out. But during the week, I refuse to accept that, even if I do it. You know, the anger comes up. Where can I be touched? To be under the authority of somebody, which is the projection of my own state. I want to have authority and domination over others. So that's where I am touched. Correct. And when you say that, how much you want out, don't tell me that you really want out. Mm -hmm. I see it during the week. Yeah, right. For me, to break out is to give my stubbornness and self-will that I call self-will, which is nothing but rage and fear. Right. All right. Think back during the last week. Make it two weeks. You, I want you to think, use your memory now. This is the right use of memory. Go into memory now. How many times during the past two weeks, and in connection with what other people, were you or I in ego competition with someone else? Now, you know what that means, don't you? You know what ego competition is? Arguing with somebody over something. Secret thought, well, you're not going to tell me what to do. That's ego competition. How many of you have been in ego competition in the last two weeks? That is where you can be touched, isn't it? That's where you're living. That's where you are living in an unreal world. Even if it only happens for a brief second down at the business office or in the home. Haven't you ever just watched your, your mind when you're talking with other people? watching the little subtleties, the little games you're playing with them, watching how your mind slips into its pretensions, its pretensions role. With, look, with people you have known for many, many years maybe, in that home, in that family? Where are you playing your role? And I will tell you, you know it, because you can feel it. Where you're playing a role with any other human being, you resent it, and you resent that other human being. It, it can't fail. Whether you feel, whether you feel superior or inferior, whether you feel you're the commander or you're the servant. Either role, you won't have any love for that other person. You will resent him or her, calling it love or kindness or helpfulness. Well, I don't know about you, I'm going to put an end to this business. Right 
in the middle of my personal life, I'm going to put an end to it. What are you going to do? You're going to come to classes and read books, or are you going to put an end to it? Okay. Don't cry. Don't cry over what you have to do. You're just adding a, another problem to it. Don't scream. Don't fight. Why are you doing that? Drop it. Drop the tears. You don't have the courage to drop your tears, that's why. You're afraid. You're afraid to drop the tears, aren't you? It's all you know. It's all you've ever known. No wonder you're afraid of dropping them. That's why you're afraid of dropping the fight, the scorn, the sneering. And I've warned you and I'll use that word warning very deliberately. I've warned you against sneering at the truth. Unconsciously, right here in this group. Sneering at the truth would be egotism resisting it. That's what it amounts to. Mm -hmm. This is why it's a very faint chance of people who come here, and I know they're not coming back, I tell, ask them to watch what they say in the car on the way home because I know they'll sneer. And there might be one out of those two or three men or women in that car who has something right in them and they will detect the sneering against the truth and know that it's wrong. And that one person in that car might have a chance. They might come back or they might read a book or something. It's, it's very unlikely. But nevertheless, they are given that chance, that one small chance. The devil sneers. If you sneer, you're a devil. You are the devil itself. That's the only devil there is, you or me. And then you tell me whether a devil can want this. Yes. someone to agree with you. You get so nervous. We get so nervous unless we can find someone to agree with our neurosis, with our sickness. Why don't we have the courage to stop finding people who will agree with our sickness? And I'm sure it's quite clear to you that sickness loves sickness. Two neurotics against the world. Two married neurotics against the world. Uh, in uh, in uh, Los Angeles, at the talk, uh, middle-aged, I was handling the books, the tapes, at the time, and a middle-aged lady came up with the usual questions, uh, which is the best book? I asked her, are you familiar with the books? No. And then without any further opportunity for me to speak, I got which I call record number 14 and a half and filed it up here. My husband ran off with another woman, left me, dumped me with the bills. I've got to struggle and go to work. I used to be a secretary. Uh, my friend here, the man that was, came with her, is going to teach me to be a real estate broker. What book would you suggest that I buy to help me? So, as I say, in that moment, I was acknowledging that she was talking, but I was watching other people in the books. I filed her under number, record number 14 and a half in the famous cabinet, and uh, picked up Dollar Psycho Mystic Path and handed it to her. I got a little more blurb from her, got the money, and she said, what do you think of that? And I said, it's a very good book, ma'am. Went about another person. <laughs> And in that moment, I saw that woman in standing in complete, dumbfounded, addled shock. She wanted 
me to psychologically answer all her idiotic questions, and they were idiotic. And I answered the question, what do you think of that? That being the book, I said, it's a good book. I got, I did get a little ego thrill out of what I did. Maybe I am right now yeah, right. in reflecting the picture. Yeah. But I saw 14 and a half played yeah. but in a oh. one file game. Yeah. It's completely unavoidable when you're at a meeting like that. Completely unavoidable not to be buttonholed, to use a common phrase, and uh, just stand there and work on yourself. You know what's coming. It's always the same thing with minor variations on the theme, as Larry said. So what is stupidity? What is stupidity? How would you define stupidity from the real viewpoint? Yes? To be absorbed in my own little world. Ah, very good. Very good. Not knowing or caring that any other world exists but that little corner. Me? Me? Yeah? See, and I know you know this, but review it. When I'm under the illusion that my thoughts are my world, I'll fight to the death, literally, to protect that world, not knowing I'm protecting nonsense, lies, illusions. And of course, because I have no brains, society can con me with its propaganda into telling me that it's my real world. Here we're told something different. As shocking, as shocking as it is to us, we're told that the world of ordinary thought is not the real world at all, but the delusion, delusory, illusory world that I have built up. Because no one ever told me anything else until now. No one ever told me anything. They told me the opposite. With big smiles, they told me how to be successful and why I should be successful in the social world. And it, and it kind of made sense because if I was poor as a kid, which many of us were, if I was poor as a kid and someone said, look, security lies in piling up a lot of money, no matter how you get it, cut corners wherever you can because that's the kind of a dog-eat world it is. Well, sure, you've got to have money to buy a house and have food. It makes, it makes quote marks, sense to me, see, until I see the whole nonsense of it because I am not, not the person who needs the ego security of having a lot of money. Then I can take care of the, the roof over my head and the bread in whatever way I can. And it doesn't make much difference, really. Stupidity is screaming for an answer and not hearing it because it doesn't fit my pattern. Yeah, that's very good. Yes. Yes, indeed because it doesn't fit my pattern. Okay. Where can I find, where can I find a shame to work on? Right? Where can I find a shameful thing about myself to work on? Start at the beginning. Why am, why am I ashamed? Who is feeling ashamed? What is the, what is the vanity revolving around my shame? Who is ashamed? A thought. A thought is going through my mind that I did a bad thing or I can't control that habit. I identify with that thought and call it me, and now I'm in a trap because me can't get rid of me. So I can consciously work with that shame, whatever it is. I don't care what it is. I can work with that shame with real profit by not being ashamed, but by understanding instead. Which I'll tell you, I'll tell you is a big leap in the dark, which we have to do 20 times a day. You understand that, do you not? You know what it means to leap in the dark. To leap in the dark, for example, I'm in a crisis situation, or in the home, office, business, anyway, uh, even a minor crisis situation, a small one, and I say to myself, as best I can understand what I'm saying to myself, I'm going to react 
in a new way instead of in my old way of resistance and always having that quick wisecrack answer that is leaping in the dark because it places me in the position of not having my usual answer it's as simple as that and as complex as that I have cut off I have put an end temporarily to my usual blowing up my usual blabber mouthery I put an end to it that is leaping into the dark because it leaves me without being who I always am that dynamic intelligent person that angry person who always flares up for one split second one split second I am faced with a horror the horror being I don't know who I am which is the beginning of putting an end to the monster in me for one split second I don't know who I am which is tremendous it means the ending of thought and then bang it goes again so I come back again and I come back again and I come back again not caring what happens to what I call me because I've caught that first glimpse that there's something else besides the neurotic sick lying me there is something else besides the sick scared me and that's what I'm after yes wisecracking is as good a way as anger to cover up the real person that I mean the way I really am they fear the feeling of uncertainty and insecurity because wisecracking is very very cruel yeah. there's all kind of ways we do it depending on our conditioning and our natural personality if you want to call it that all kind of ways okay uh, all right go ahead yes process of inner division and as we talk about things it's apparent that we're talking about a condition of being which is really all one thing and all of the words that we're using are only used to describe this how the significance of this is that as you pointed out before friends you cannot choose your neuroses if you are neurotic you are neurotic if you are jealous, you also have the rest of the bag. You are also angry, Correct. hostile, venomous, violent, and the whole mess. Correct. So that it's not like we can dissect a little bit of it. <coughs> the whole thing has to go. Right. Um, just observing you know, the way that the work is spoken about, it is clear that the words as we say are not the thing and we are observing as i said an inner state of being larry commented earlier on the fear which he had observed in a certain person and it's evident that this fear going by that word is the same thing as this sort of quality of lostness or what would you call it anxiety or heaviness that is in this same person they are all the same thing. We begin at the root and excise the whole problem at once. Finally, we have to work on it bit by bit as we can see it, but obviously we're after the whole thing so that we become then not divided but inwardly one. Okay, very good, yes, indeed. <clears throat>